Hi, my name is EJ Massa. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to spin a little yarn about my experiences with the PlayStation 1. So if you just want to skip to the restoration and mod stuff, use the conveniently produced chapters below. I was always a Nintendo boy. Even when Sega was aggressively vying for my attention with its more maturely marketed system. I couldn't really stay away from Nintendo's lineup of amazing games like Mario, Zelda, Metroid, and Mario. However, there was one game in the Super Nintendo lineup that made my defection from Nintendo inevitable. Final Fantasy VI. Or, as we called it at the time, Final Fantasy III. I was introduced to Square's JRPG franchise one day in Blockbuster Video. I happened to see that weird stop-motion commercial featuring a gruff-voiced Moogle, and for some reason, that marketing worked on me. So I picked it up, and that changed everything. It elevated what I thought video games could be in terms of story, gameplay, and music. As a result, I wanted to consume everything that Square made. When the PlayStation came out, my cousins got it, and I thought, it was interesting. They had a demo disc with Battle Arena to Shinden and Jumping Flash. While these certainly impressed me visually for what the system was capable of at the time, I'll admit the gameplay didn't knock my socks off. So I was content waiting for the Super Nintendo successor, the Nintendo Ultra 64. Not only that, this little screenshot from Nintendo Power showing Final Fantasy VI characters rendered on a 64-bit platform gave me hope that Square would support the Nintendo platform. And on Christmas morning of 1994, I got the Nintendo 64, and I happily played Mario 64, Wave Race, and many others. But soon I noticed there were lots of sports titles, racing, and action games, but no role-playing games. Quest 64 came out a few years later and I rented that, but that was a huge disappointment. And so was the fact that there were no role-playing games. As I had just gotten into JRPGs a couple years ago on the Super Nintendo, so this whole genre evaporated as soon as I got into it. At this point, I had taken my eye off the PlayStation Ball, and I didn't even notice that Square had jumped ship to greener pastures at Sony because they wanted to utilize their CD technology and video playback to tell their stories. It would all make sense to me when I saw this commercial for Final Fantasy VII. Beyond the edge of reality lies a story of ultimate conquest, a story of war and friendship, a story of a love that can never be, and a hatred that always was. And now, the most anticipated epic adventure of the year will never come to a theater near you. Final Fantasy VII. PlayStation. Oh my god. And here I was, stuck with Turok Dinosaur Hunter, and I was now jealous of my cousin's jumping flash machine. I envied it. Here's the thing. We just got the Nintendo 64, and I didn't really have a good argument to justify getting a new console under a year later, but I was obsessed with Final Fantasy VII. My birthday rolled around in September of 1997, and my sister, who was much older than me and basically an adult at this point, brought me into Sears during a trip to the mall and said, Hey, I'll be busy for your birthday. I have some Sears points on my credit card. Why don't you pick out a game? And there I saw the new release section, and there was Final Fantasy VII. In a fevered state, I just pointed to that jewel case with the white artwork on the front, knowing full well I had no way to play it. I just irrationally needed it. So I came home with it and just stared at the manual for like a whole month. My mother was collecting laundry out of my room, and she noticed this PlayStation game sitting there, and she was confused. She was like, did you get this game even though you have no way to play it? And I was embarrassed. I told her how I didn't really want to ask for a new system, but I had to have the game. She understood. And for Christmas of 1997, a Sony PlayStation showed up under the Christmas tree, and I was off to the races. I gobbled up every Square release. Final Fantasy Tactics. Then I discovered Capcom was over at Sony as well, so I got into Resident Evil 1 and 2, and Mega Man X4, which now had cartoons in it. 
What am I fighting for? Not that I hated Nintendo 64, no, but it felt like I only got half a system. You know, amazing platformers, racers, shooters, and sports games, but then I had to go to the PlayStation for more cerebral experiences like JRPGs, survival horror, and 2D platformers with excellent hand-drawn animation. I never saw it as a rivalry between the two systems. It was more of a partnership. They complemented each other perfectly. Somewhere along the years, my disk drive of the PlayStation 1 stopped working properly. I took it apart a few times to try to fix it, but I put it in a box somewhere during the GameCube era, and I just lost track of it. I just don't know where my childhood PlayStation 1 is. So that finally brings me to the topic of this video. I was browsing a used game store in my local mall, Stateline Games. They have a great selection of retro game carts, but they also have an as-is section where they'll sell beat-up consoles and peripherals or common games for cheap. That day I picked up this Nyko Perfect Shop for a buck. It makes playing games like House of the Dead Overkill much more fun. Works great. Best dollar I ever spent, really. You could even say, a bang for my buck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I also noticed this, an as-is PlayStation 1. No cables or controllers, and it has an ugly crime killer sticker on it, and it was 25 bucks. I shook it and it kind of rattles a bit. I figured, what the heck, maybe it works. So I purchased it there on the spot. It was cheaper than many of the Facebook Marketplace listings, so why not? On closer inspection, I have a theory that the rattling is the missing ball bearing on the disk drive, which must have fallen into the system. Nothing about the system screams that it's broken, so let's just find some cables and see if it works. I found a memory card and controller, and then popped in my Mega Man X4 disk from my childhood. Powered it on, and... Is there anything more satisfying than the startup drone? GameCube might be a close second for satisfying startup jingles. It looks like the game starts up, the controller port works, runs perfectly. So I guess the only reason it's sold as is, is the ugly crime killer sticker they didn't care to remove. Well, that's good news for me because now I have a cheaper PlayStation as a result. I always love the 2D games on the PlayStation. They look sort of like a deluxe Super Nintendo. Probably helps that the PlayStation started as sort of a CD-based Super Nintendo before Nintendo betrayed Sony for... Philips. Great choice, Nintendo. Gee, it sure is boring around here. My boy. So that brings me to the goal of this video. I want to enhance and restore this PlayStation so I don't have to rely on the optical drive to play games. Optical media won't last forever, a quick Google search shows that a professionally pressed CD could last anywhere from 20 to 200 years. And I'm planning to live at least another 200 years. So I got the XStation mod which will allow the PlayStation to run disk images off a of microSD. It also means the PlayStation will run much quieter. Not only that, after a moderate amount of playtime, the internal power supply was causing the PlayStation to run hot, so I got a Pico power supply to replace it. I got both products from GameTech.us, and I'll have a link to the specific products in the description below. The XStation packaging definitely tickles my member berries with its faux jewel case design. Inside the box you have two QSBs, one for the 5500 model PlayStations, and one for the 1000 model PlayStations. The model number on the back of this used one is 5501. Make sure you have a compatible model number PlayStation before purchasing the X station. In this case, I'll be using this QSB for the install. Now it's time to get my hands dirty and hopefully not wreck a perfectly working PlayStation. I removed all the screws on the bottom of the system and removed the top cover, unplugged the disc laser, and chucked it into a nearby river. We won't be needing that. Then I removed the screws from the metal shield and carefully took it off. 
Underneath, I found one source of the rattle, which looks to be part of a jewel case in black plastic, possibly belonging to the fragmented disc holder thing. Removed all the screws from the board and took that out as well, and found the other source of the rattle, which was indeed the missing ball bearing from the disk drive. Mystery solved. You line up this part of the QSB with this large solder blob. And when you do that, you can see that all the connections naturally line up with specific spots on the board that you need to solder. However, you'll notice two spots that are covered with solder resist on my version of the board. I'll need to scratch off those specific vias so I can actually solder. Using a Zacto knife, I carefully scraped off those vias until the shiny metal was exposed. Then I went over to the leftmost one and scraped off that one as well. I put the QSB back into place using that big soldering blob as a starting point and making sure all the connections lined up properly across the QSB. I hit that blob with a little flux from a flux marker and soldered that blob onto its connection on the QSB, freezing it into place. I went over to the via that I scraped off before and hit it with a flux marker, then tapped it with my soldering iron loaded up with solder. And there, both sides of the QSB are structurally adhering to the board, which frees me to go around the QSB and solder all the connections to the board. And that's what I did. Starting from the right, working my way across the middle, hitting it with flux and soldering along the way. Finishing up with this pad in the top right corner of the QSB, which I add solder to, and then connected a short wire, which will need to go to this point in the board. You'll also need to remove this resistor right here, which I removed after heating up the solder. You can see that's where the resistor was, and here's where you connect the other end of the wire. One note, the kit I bought did not come with a wire, so I had to source this myself, which luckily I do have, so keep that in mind if you wish to mod this on your own. Speaking of doing this mod on your own, this is probably what's preventing most people from installing the X-Station themselves. Lifting the pins on the IC701 on the other side of the board. And I won't lie to you, it is nerve-wracking. In general, here's the tactic I used. I got an ordinary dental pick and placed it just to the side of the pin. Then I brought my soldering iron and touched it to the pad to heat it up. Not the pin, the pad. And then used the pick to move the pin out of place and then bent it up off the area. After I used my finger to finish bending the pin up even further, these are the exact pins you'll need to lift and it was too nerve wracking for me to film every single one. So check out Voltar's video, which I'll link in the description below. He goes through the whole process pin by pin. But by the end, I have the exact pins isolated off the board according to the directions. I may have accidentally removed some soldering pads under the IC pins, but I'm not really looking to revert this back to its original form, so that's fine. The IC is small, so I definitely recommend some sort of magnifying device, and I use this cheap one from Hobby Lobby that I use for crafts, but it works here too. After that, I checked my continuity of the soldering joints on the QSB with a multimeter. I used this specific continuity guide from mmmonkey.co.uk. I checked to make sure that each pinout on the ribbon cable connector reached points on that guide and found that pin 19 didn't have continuity and touched up that soldering joint and then it was all set. I definitely recommend that you check continuity to the pins if you're having issues. Just go pin by pin and make sure that they have continuity with each number in the picture. With that done, I slid in the ribbon cable, blue side up, locking it into place. Place the board back into the shell screwing it back in. Before putting the shield back on, I threaded the ribbon cable through the slit, then screwed the metal shield back in. I gently folded, but not heavily creased, the ribbon cable thusly. I brought in the X-Station board and installed these plastic white jumpers under the board. Here are the feet there that I put in. I connected the ribbon cable to the board and put it down on these two metal pegs that once held the disk drive. I connected the power supply and the controller ports back in and put the cover back on because before I install the new Pico power supply, I wanted to make sure that the X-Station works. I put in a micro SD card loaded with the X-Station firmware in one game, which is Mega Man X4. I'll quickly show you how I set it up. You format the card to FAT32 or XFAT. You create a folder in the root called 00xstation. I downloaded the latest firmware which contains loader.bin and an update.bin. And you'll paste those into that folder. 
then you'll copy your games outside of the 00x station folder, and you'll be good to go. Make sure to close the lid before starting and booyah, x station loads up. It says no games found, so I press triangle, toggle down to refresh game list, and it found my game on the SD card. I fast loaded it to skip the intros, and it works perfectly. It even recognizes the same save I made when I put in my childhood disc. So any saves you made on disc, as long as you have the same disc image, should work. Played it a bit, and I was satisfied that it functioned. You know, I sort of miss the disc drive buzz. It is a nostalgic part of the experience in a way, but the convenience of the X station is so great, I'll get over it. Now I can load the SD card with legitimate backups of games that I own. I can't wait to just scroll through endless legitimate backups of games that I own. You might be wondering how I'm actually going to play this PlayStation once it's done. Well, I have a SCART cable here from Insurrection Industries. I'll probably plug it into actually that CRT behind me, which does have a SCART input and looks beautiful. The colors are great. Or I'll plug it into an RGB upscaler like the Framemeister to a modern TV. Now that I know that it works, I loosened the screws on the power supply, took out the power supply, slid in the new Pico power supply, connecting the wire with a 3D printed insert, sliding that connector into the case as well. I bought a Meanwell 12 volt, 5 amp, 60 watt power brick that was recommended by the seller of the power supply. And I'll have a link to that Amazon listing in the description below. There's just one more thing to deal with, this crime killer sticker. I don't want it there. So I took the upper empty case and soaked it in some hot water for a few minutes. Then I took a plastic putty knife as to not scratch the case and gently scrape the sticker off. I scraped it until all the sticker was visually gone, but you can still see some sticky residue on there. So I sprayed a dash of goo gone onto a cloth. I wiped the case until it was squeaky clean. I didn't overdo it with the goo gone, just in case that damages the case in some way. So I tried not to use too much. Then I washed off the excess goo gone. Once all clean and completely bone dry, I finally put the top cover on and screwed in the case screws. One attachment I considered that some people do is they install a 3D printed caddy to cover this hole, but I kind of like seeing the X station board. It looks pretty cool to me. I don't know. Plus, you'll have the lid down most of the time after loading up an SD card with a bunch of games anyway, so you won't see the disk drive area often. And even though there isn't a disk drive anymore, you do need to have the lid closed, or else it'll go to the memory card CD player screen. I considered putting on the X station sticker because it does kind of look cool, but I just did a lot of effort removing a sticker, so I'll keep it vanilla for now. With all that wrapped up, it's time for a true test drive. I thought it was only appropriate that I test out my enhanced modded PlayStation with the sticker that caught my eye in the first place. That's right, Crime Killer. So I loaded up an SD card with the Crime Killer disc image, and let me tell you something about Crime Killer. Crime Killer. Fucking sucks. I hope you found this video helpful or entertaining or both. Let me know what your PlayStation memories are in the comments below and give the video a like. Thanks for stopping by and until next time, bye.